If, if everyone could take a seat so we could get started here. Great, thanks. Welcome to this morning's panel. Uh, we're gonna be talking about rights in conflict, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religious liberty. I'm Preeta Bansal and I'll be moderating and I will uh, introduce my fellow panelists in a, in, a, in a moment here. Our topic this morning is inspired in part by the growing recognition by city councils, legislatures, and courts throughout the country of legal rights to be free from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. A number of legislative bodies have passed anti-discrimination laws that are applicable to housing, employment, and other areas that forbid discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So, and, and, and now also Congress is currently considering the Employment Non-Discrimination Act of 2007 that would prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, which contains some exemptions for religious organizations. But at the same time that we see this growing recognition and protection on the basis of sexual orientation, there's also coinciding a growing recognition and push for statutory protection for religious freedom. So in 1993, as I'm sure all of you know, Congress adopted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act by an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 97 to three in the Senate and a voice vote in the House. The modest aim of RIFRA was to restore the traditional standard for protection of religious liberty that had existed before Employment Division versus Smith, a 1990 case that said that the First Amendment does not require states to accommodate religious practices where they, con where they conflict with generally applicable laws, such as a ban on the use of peyote. But RIFRA would not merely create a religious exception to drug laws. It would also establish a principle that could entitle religious landlords, employers, and service providers to seek exemption from anti-discrimination laws if those laws conflict with religious doctrine. Although RIFRA was later overturned by the Supreme Court in 1997 as exceeding Congress's powers under the 14th Amendment, a number of states since then have adopted their own mini RIFRAs or you know, very similar versions of RIFRA. And Congress continues to express its very overwhelming bipartisan support for protection of religious freedom. In the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act of 2000, and in current debates concerning uh, the workplace, workplace Religious Freedom Act. Um, courts, too, have gotten into the battle. We have the Alaska Supreme Court held recent, or a few years ago that landlords may not refuse on religious grounds to rent apartments to unmarried cohabiting couples pursuant to a state law that protected such couples from housing discrimination. But the Ninth Circuit held to the contrary on federal constitutional grounds of religious freedom. So you have, once again, the state law coming up against constitutional religious freedom protections. And even without judicial involvement, the Catholic Charities of Boston, one of the nation's oldest adoption agencies, said it was forced to get out of the adoption business in 2006 uh, when, the state, when the state of Massachusetts refused to renew its license to be an adoption agency because it would not pledge to abide by the state laws barring discrimination against same-sex couples uh, when, it was in, when it was doing its adoption placements. All of these various clashes of rights raise a number of issues, um, some of which we'll discuss in the panel, but let me lay out some of the issues. First of all, is the state's desire to forbid discrimination against certain groups compelling enough to outweigh an individual's sincere religious abhorrence to practices that may include homosexuality? How are courts to determine which religious beliefs are genuine? What of the fact that in the past, some people and groups have invoked religious beliefs to shield otherwise intolerable behavior, such as child abuse in cult communities, resistance to mandatory child immunization, racial discrimination, or polygamy. Second, what happens when the protection of gay rights becomes no longer a, a matter of legislative grace or legislative protection, but instead is a constitutional right, the burdening of which becomes subject to heightened or strict scrutiny by the courts? In that case, who does the balancing and the accommodation is it, is it legislatures or is it courts and what's the right body? <clears throat> now, now that same-sex marriage is getting increasing constitutional protection in a number of states, does this alter the analysis? Third, to what extent does the degree of religious accommodation and practice, uh, the accommodation of religious practice depend on the extent to which religious entities receive tax-exempt status, such as universities, or receive public funds? And finally, to what extent do the functions of religiously denominated institutions really matter? For example, is a local parish Catholic church the same thing 
as Catholic charities for purposes of accommodation analysis. The former, a, a Catholic church, operates almost exclusively on funds that are derived from parishioners and the diocese. It sponsors religious worship, and it operates on the basis of close geographical ties. While the latter, Catholic Charities, receives a majority, often over 80% in some areas, from state and federal funds, and provides public services to a wide array of recipients that are not defined by religion. In any event, these are just a number of the questions that arise when, when rights come into conflict. We have with us a really extraordinary panel to discuss the context in which some of these issues arise, and then we'll get into a, a discussion of them. On my far left, we have Jean Nickel, who is a professor of law and the prior dean at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and he was formerly the president of the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. To his right, we have Steve Aiden, who is the senior legal counsel at Alliance Defense Fund. Uh, Steve, prior to this time, uh, prior to being at the Alliance Defense Fund, directed litigation for the Rutherford Institute and the Center for Law and Religious Freedom of the Christian Legal Society. He's been involved in litigation involving religious freedom rights for, for many, many decades, can I say that? For many years. Um, and then we have Laura. Laura Schwartz is the legal director and chief legislative counsel of the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign is the nation's largest civil rights organization advocating for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender equality. And to my immediate left is Jeremy Gunn. And we're very grateful that Jeremy came and uh, participated in this panel on somewhat short notice. He really accommodated his schedule uh, and we're, in light of uh, the fact that we no longer have two other participants on the panel. Uh, Jeremy is very distinguished in this field. He's the director of the ACLU program on religion and belief. He's also a senior fellow for religion and human rights at Emory University Law School. He's done some very uh, distinguished academic work, and I'm told that this morning he just finished a book on religion in the Cold War, so and sent it off to the publisher. So he's had a productive day already. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I, the, the format of our model of our of our panel will be that we'll ask each of the participants to uh, give a brief overview of the topic for no more than five minutes, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. Uh, for about another 20 to 25 minutes, and that should leave us another 30, 30 to 35 minutes for uh, questions from the audience. So I'm going to start, if that's okay, for, for, with, to my far left with Jean. Thanks, Brita. Um, let me uh, add my thanks and welcome to everyone. I, like most of you, I was just in the uh, plenary session, and I, uh, I walked in late as Pam Carlin uh, was saying something about how important it was for everyone to hook up. I thought this might have been the campus uh, section from life as um, I've known it. But then the discussion turned to a claim of hordes of Martians voting for Democrats, and I knew that uh, Ashley was in the right spot. I, I'm, uh, I'm not an expert in the law and religion stuff. I think I'm here to speak about at least some of these issues from a university context. Um, uh, one of the principal ways, not the only way, but one of the principal ways in which uh, the values of religious free exercise and sexual orientation equality has come into collision on university campuses uh, has to do with uh, the applicability of university non-discrimination policies to student uh, religious groups, those policies which typically apply to all student organizations and likely all uh, aspects, all programs within the university as they apply to um, student religious groups uh, have raised uh, particular collisions of interest in, in ways that I, I must say I find both important uh, and difficult, uh, uh, challenging as a constitutional lawyer. Uh, some such religious groups, I think uh, my colleague here has uh, represented them on occasion. They've, uh, refuse to comply or to commit to comply with policies, uh, non-discrimination policies as applied to lesbians and gay men, <coughs> making the claim that opening their membership uh, to gay students would violate their rights of expressive association or of uh, religious uh, exercise. Uh, denying university recognition, of course, doesn't literally prohibit uh, exercises of religion attempts at expression, uh, but because of their religious beliefs, uh, student uh, 
groups would uh, lose typically some assets, uh, assets of uh, importance, uh, the right to student funding or the use of university facilities or sometimes the, the use of the university email system. So some significant burden uh, is pressed uh, in these cases. Universities, on the other hand, say uh, with uh, maybe unsurprising uh, fervor that college-sanctioned student groups have to be open to all students. All students, of course, pay for the fees, uh, open access, non-discrimination on the basis of race and sex and sexual orientation and religion uh, is an essential uh, cornerstone of uh, university governance. Uh, it's uh, a requirement, uh, an, an essential aspect of uh, achieving and serving a diverse student body, uh, granting these exceptions, it is said, weakens those non-discrimination policies and uh, potentially makes universities complicit in discrimination against their own students. Again, if nothing else, demonstrating the difficulty of maintaining a commitment to both equality and tolerance for religious difference. Uh, there's a conflict in other, I think, uh, pragmatic senses. Uh, in theory, at least, universities could be sued either way they turn uh, by uh, student who's excluded from such a religious group under a claim of university endorsement, which I assume would likely fail, or by the group itself if exclusion isn't allowed because of university policies. Uh, I think, too, there's a, I'm not much of a legal researcher anymore, but there is a conflict between the circuits or at least uh, some of the federal district courts on this question of uh, uh, religious uh, exercise and expressive association. Uh, and there's a lot to say about that. I'll try to uh, sort of quickly lay out uh, some of my thoughts, but they are very uh, moderate and uh, tentative, unlike uh, my thoughts usually have been. Uh, some universities and some advocates have argued for uh, accommodating both interests, sort of uh, trying to split the difference or uh, reduce the arena of disagreement. Requiring, for example, that membership in student groups be open, but conceding that leadership in the student religious groups uh, could be limited to adherence. Trying to take that lesson from the Boy Scouts case, which dealt with uh, leadership, uh, and uh, JC's case, which uh, involved membership, though it seems to me that is likely a stretch, uh, looking hard at those cases. Or trying, and this probably doesn't get it exactly right, but trying to separate the status from the mission so that you could perhaps require based on religious tenets, uh, a belief that homosexuality is wrong, but you couldn't, uh, without more, uh, exclude uh, homosexuals, a rule that I think is probably too thin to regulate. I mean, it's understandable, comprehensible, uh, or defensible, but it may well be too thin to regulate primary student conduct. Uh, some have sought to distinguish between money and regulation, as these aren't really literally forced inclusion cases like the Boy Scouts case or the uh, JC's case, uh, though they certainly involve burdens uh, on the basis of religious uh, belief, or exploring the centrality of the religious or the expressive claim, uh, trying to narrow the range of conflict. Uh, but that uh, rather uh, worrisomely uh, goes the route of telling religious or expressive groups potentially tell them what they actually believe in and what they don't, which is problematic for First Amendment purposes. Uh, I think, uh, we'll talk about this, that there are uh, some powerful uh, justifications for such rules, but I don't think you can get around the notion of their collision. Uh, I'd uh, like to talk some more about that and talk, talk about a few matters which I think are clear in this muddled arena, uh, and then leave it at that. So I'll stop okay, there. Okay, great. See you. Thank you, Frida. Uh, it's an honor to be here and a privilege. Uh, I'm uh, grateful to be addressing a crowd that uh, is truly committed to uh, rights, to equality, and uh, particularly in this room to the rights of religious persons. Uh, I am Senior Legal Counsel with the Alliance Defense Fund, which is one of the premier public interest organizations in the country defending the rights of religious persons. Naturally, those rights lately have seemed to come in conflict more and more often with the demand for equal rights for homosexuals. 
I think there are some principles that we can all agree on, and I hope I can articulate those as we try to navigate this difficult area. Uh, when Alexis de Tocqueville traveled the country in the 1830s, he observed that Americans were different from much of the rest of the world in one peculiar aspect. That aspect was that they were committed to equality more than just about anything else. He said it was remarkable that Americans had no pretensions about class. They would address each other, he said, as man to man. We would say person to person. Uh, when de Tocqueville uh, talked to whatever person in whatever socioeconomic uh, status, he did not discern that there was uh, any difference in uh, self-esteem between different persons of different uh, socioeconomic strata. And he commended the country for that. In fact, um, yeah, and uh, he said that, uh, let me back up a minute and uh, quote from, uh, actually move forward, and quote from an eminent, eminent anthropologist uh, by the name of Ruth Benedict. Uh, she wrote in uh, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword that equality is the highest, most moral American basis for hopes for a better world. It means to us freedom from tyranny, from interference, and from unwanted impositions. It means equality before the law and the right to better one's condition in life. It is the basis for the rights of man as they are organized in the world we know. We uphold the virtue of equality even when we violate it and we fight hierarchy with a righteous indignation. Americans trust equality as they trust nothing else. Even liberty, de Tocqueville said, often in practice we let fly out the window while we look the other way but we live equality. I think that's why most Americans would prefer to wait in long lines at airport security than tolerate racial profiling, even if arguably profiling at, in, uh, at the airport based on uh, national origin conceivably or whether somebody has an Islamic name would be rational in some sense. I think most of us, myself included, would rather wait in long lines to, than to see people pulled out and treated differently based on where they're from or what their faith is. And that's commendable. But these rights in conflict, I think, are, uh, can be boiled down to two essences, this clash of rights. The first is what I would call the egalitarian principle or the equality principle. That's what de Tocqueville was talking about, what Ruth Benedict was talking about. We all have a commitment to equality. But the second is called the autonomy principle. We all also have and articulate in various ways a commitment to personal autonomy. That autonomy includes the right to believe what we will about ultimate issues like, is there a God? If so, am I accountable to God in some way? If not, how then should I live my life? It also includes the right to profess, as the Supreme Court has said many times, the right to believe includes the right to profess as a fundamental right. What about when the right to believe and profess has to do with the right to believe and profess about the ultimate matter of human sexuality. Are we created by a God who designed us in a certain way or not? Uh, many religious persons believe that we are. Many religious persons uh, believe that uh, our Creator ordained for both sexuality to be expressed in a particular way and marriage to be expressed in a particular way. And, uh, most of the religious people I know strive to articulate and express that in a respectful way. We don't always succeed, but we are trying. But the rights come in conflict, conflict when it is perceived that that expression of a particular view of sexuality and of marriage is actually an expression of bigotry, hatred, and inequality. And the contexts that we're going to explore today are different situations in which persons of religious faith come into contact with and frequently in conflict with persons who believe otherwise about sexual orientation. I look forward to having this dialogue. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to first thank ACS and in particular the valiant Praveen Fernandez, uh, a lawyer who's stand to whose standards I aspire. Uh, for having us all here, um, this might as well be called the American Candy Society, meaning brain candy. It's one of the rare opportunities outside of law school to uh, really engage in these issues on a, on a very strong level, and I'm glad to be here. 
I'm particularly glad to be able to discuss this topic, rights and conflict. Um, I think that the title says it all, and at the risk of sounding like coffee talk, are these rights, are they in conflict, discuss. That's what I want to do. <laughs> um, in order to have this discussion, I feel it's important to lay the groundwork of what we mean by rights and what we mean by conflict. Now, in the area that I uh, feel most comfortable in and that I think is it, both instructive but very, very obviously distinguishable from the university and law school realm is the employment context. Um, more and more employers, in fact over 95% of the Fortune 500 companies, have um, anti-discrimination policies that cover sexual orientation and many as well now include gender identity. This is also the practice in several states, many municipalities, um, a large proportion of our country is covered and, and many of our workers are covered by um, a non-discrimination policy, although in 33 states it, you can still be fired for being gay. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the conversation has come up, are these rights, these rights to non-discrimination in conflict with religious rights? Now, I think that, um, and, and I think you know, Steve would probably be among the first to agree that the question of what rights a court is recognizing and sometimes occasionally in, in a more conservative speak, inventing is, is a term you hear a lot. Um, you know, there are rights that we know are inherent in our sense of order, liberty, that, that we see and recognize in the Constitution. And there are civil rights that are statutorily created and, and to which we've bound ourselves and we're mo more familiar and I think more comfortable over the decades with our rights to protection from discrimination on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the ba basis of religion, and on the basis of national origin. Now, what it is to be discriminated against on the basis of race down to the facts, down in the weeds of cases, um, you certainly get to factual questions, but it's, it's fairly clear a person is of a, of a protected class they're discriminated against. Discrimination on the basis of religion, I think in many ways, is a more fascinating question to reach because what constitutes discrimination on the basis of religion? I think you can tell a first year law class, well, if I don't hire you because you're an evangelical Christian, I've discriminated against you on the basis of religion. But what if I don't hire you because I do 60% of my businesses on Saturday and you're an Adventist? Have I discriminated? What if I can't promote you because I do you know, a, an enormous amount of my business on Christmas Day and I need you there and you didn't step up to the plate and, and do that job? Have I discriminated? And to flip that, what is the right? Is the right to religious liberty the right to be who you are and take the job. I'm a good computer programmer and I'm Muslim. Don't decline to hire me. Or is it, I'm Muslim, I want to be a computer programmer at your company, but I refuse to work on the project that you're doing that teaches young girls about sexuality uh, in, in, in schools. Have I been discriminated against if I'm not accommodated. You notice I actually haven't given sexual orientation examples yet because I really don't think there's a difference. And one thing that I'd like to explore is, you know, we've go grown comfortable, this is a very pluralistic society, and I think nowhere is our pluralism developing in a more rich way than in the workplace, which for many people, given our very segregated housing and education patterns, for many people is the first time they truly experience diversity. And for the GLBT community, is for many people the first time they truly are subject to protections. It's also what we need for our livelihood. Universities and law schools are important. We're there for four years and, and three um, respectively, and then we go. Now, it's where we develop our values and ideals in many ways, so it's important that these are protected. But the workplace is where you, you know, go to make your life support yourself and your family, and you do it for several decades. So the question is, what are the rights and are they in tension? I'm just going to name some rights that have been, some, some things that have been stated as rights. They are certainly values, but are they rights? That have been put forth as rights that people have in the workplace. The right to require an employer to honor your views if they are religiously based. But interestingly, is, interestingly not if they're based on another motivation. The right to be licensed by the state. The right to be subsidized. The right to subject others to proselytizing. 
the, the right to a different standard or different schedules than coworkers, the right to change or get an exception from a corporate ethic, image, or value, the right to limit or alter medical care or that third parties receive, the right to redefine a safety officer's duty pr to protect the public as a duty to protect those people or institutions that one deems acceptable. Now, I'm not making this up. These are all rights that have basically been litigated. And I would argue that these are not so-called rights and that they should not be codified and created as rights through our civil rights laws or through our jurisprudence. I don't believe that there is a tension between religious liberty and protection from non-discrimination because I believe that our workplaces have always been places that, in a sense, you do check a part of your identity at the door to be a computer programmer to make widgets, to sell hamburgers. So I would like to also say just in conclusion that it is not always necessary for lawyers who advocate from very different positions to hold different views on various cases. From my perspective, Dale was correctly decided, the Boy Scouts case, and I am a gay rights advocate. And maybe, I don't know if we can get it off the table. But I also think cases that say the government need not subsidize the Boy Scouts once they, once they hold and enforce a policy that's inconsistent with the public policy of that government, I believe that those cases are directly decided too. It is inherent in our social governmental experiment as Americans. If you think of how we adopted our Constitution, it's been described as Ulysses being bound to the mast. You take on your values and your sense of what has to be right, and then oftentimes you do sacrifice for it. That is part of our constitutional experiment, and in many regards it's part of our, of our workplace experiment and the diversity that we're seeing in public, um, in, 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 in employment. I do not believe that the argument should be framed as religious people having to make a decision between their values and their job. I believe that this so-called rights in conflict comes down to whether a person is willing to bind themselves to the obligations that inherit in their career and what their, what their responsibilities are in their job at the expense of bringing every aspect, including those with third party impact, to their job. GLBT people are very familiar with sacrificing to be who they are. And I think that it's an example that makes a lot of sense to consider in the workplace. And with that, I'll pass it on. It is a pleasure for me to uh, be here. What I would uh, like, I mean, one thing I'd like to, to mention first is something that, uh, that Preeta did not mention. I'm quoting um, the eminent uh, Steve Aiden here. I asked one of my assistants to look up anything that Steve Aiden had said about the ACLU. <laughs> and I learned that only two weeks ago, now I don't know whether they quoted you correctly, and I know how often it is to be uh, incorrect. They said that, uh, he said that uh, the ACLU is a leading advocate for moral lawlessness. So I advise you to be careful uh, in paying attention to anything I say because I'm going to be speaking about moral lawlessness. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, in the history of the United States that although equality has been a goal, as Steve mentioned, equality has not always been, in fact, the law. And we have seen a series of forms of discrimination that are defended on either religious grounds or other grounds. And we have come to realize over time how wrong those are. So we had discrimination on the basis of uh, religious beliefs. And that did not come naturally to the United States to afford all people seeking uh, freedom of religion to grant it. In fact, it was something that really started coming into the United States in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s when we started to have a very healthy respect for freedom of religion in the United States, when Catholics and Jews became part uh, of the discussion in the United States. And that's good that we got over that. Another one, of course, we did not have equality on the basis of race. And that has been a long and difficult process, and it is not over yet. But we now know that, though, that in, in the past when people would talk about it would be permissible to have discrimination on the basis of race for religious reasons, when we hear those now, we think just how wrong that language was. We also ha are now opposed to discrimination on the basis of national origin 
or, the, or discrimination on the basis of gender. Again, the laws have not quite caught up to where uh, public consciousness is, but that's another one. And so when we hear that Apostle Paul says that women should not be permitted to speak in churches, that might jangle a little bit with our ears now, and we might say, well, even in evangelical churches and in fundamentalist churches, you know, there's nothing wrong with women speaking in church. And we're not going to take some scriptures literally. But, other, but the curious thing is that people will continue to use some scriptures to find a basis for discrimination on, on uh, people. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, great uh, overcomings of discrimination was in the decision we celebrated the 40th anniversary of it. Last year was Loving versus Virginia on the miscegenation statute in the state of Virginia. And we've often heard what the lower court judge said in that case, which was, Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with his arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages between races. The fact that he separated races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. So we have a religious basis for a miscegenation law. And when we hear that now, 41 years later, well, more than 41 years later, we realize there's something wrong with that. But even when we look to what the decision was of the Virginia, Supreme, Virginia State Supreme Court, which was not quite as uh, bad but still came out with the same result, the statement was marriage as creating the most important relation in life as having more to do with the morals and civilization of a people than any other institution has always been subject to the control of the legislature. So marriage is under the control of the legislature, and the Supreme Court said, no, it's under the control, ultimately, of the Constitution. And any law that says that you cannot, you can prohibit marriage based upon the races of the couple is a violation of the Constitution. That was controversial when the decision was made. It's not controversial now. We've made progress. We all know that there is one area now that is particularly controversial, where issues of religion are raised as a basis for uh, for discrimination, and we need to be very careful about basis of discrimination. So uh, I'd like to conclude with a second point, the first one being that we have had a change over time and we need to appreciate that change. And the second one is that when people make claims on the basis of religion or requesting a free exercise exemption to a law of uh, general applicability, we, we as a society need to take those claims for exemptions from those laws very seriously. I think that the Supreme Court in the decision by Justice Scalia in 1990 in the Employment Division versus Smith did not take those rights sufficiently seriously. And the conservative majority of the court was wrong in not taking rights of religious exemption sufficiently seriously over the dissents of Justice Blackmun, Justice Brennan, and Justice Marshall. Uh, the, the religious claims need to be taken seriously and we need as a society to try to uh, be able to do that. But we also need to, be, need to understand these typically in a case-by-case -case basis to say that the general kind of statement that my religion forbids this may in fact be not simply a religious claim but a claim of prejudice disguised under the name of religion. Thank you. Um, let me try and pick up uh, some of our discussion with, uh, I guess, a statement that Laura made, which uh, in giving her examples on the various forms of anti-discrimination laws and the, the, the religious exemptions that some groups have sought from them, you said, I believe you said there's not really a difference. You said you hadn't cited yet a case involving um, sexual orientation because there really wasn't a difference between that and other kinds of anti-discrimination protections. And I want to start with Steve and ask and, and, and it's also picking up a bit on where, where Jeremy left off about the anti about loving versus Virginia and the religious basis for the claimed uh, uh, practice there. And is there a distinction uh, for religious accommodation requests where the you know where the the the, the, the anti discrimination is based on sexual orientation? Thank so you. Um, to begin with. Uh, Jeremy's narrative is powerful, especially to the folks in this room. It is the narrative that ACS and uh, its uh, uh, members uh, are familiar with, that rights progress. As we uh, progress as a society, more rights are recognized, more people are empowered. I grant the power of that narrative. 
I don't necessarily grant that the narrative is accurate or appropriate with respect to uh, rights for uh, non-heterosexuals, but you know that I, I, I don't agree with that, and I know you respect that. Where I part company in, is in a couple of places. One is uh, that um, I, I, I'd like to first remind uh, everyone that by the time of the 64 Civil Rights Act, religion was added as a protected class without question, almost as uh, uh, an afterthought. Uh, someone on the floor said religion should be one of the protected classes, and I, I don't know that there was any disagreement in the congressional record about that. That tells you something. It tells you that by the early 60s, it was generally accepted that even minority religious views should be accorded legal protection in employment and public accommodations. So we had come quite a long way down that road by the uh, middle part of the uh, uh, 20th century. The uh, second uh, point I'd like to make is that within the narrative that uh, I think all of us accept, which is the narrative with respect to race and national origin and to some extent gender, within that narrative, religious people, we all know, have played an important part in affirming that equal rights are due to those protected groups. For religious people, actually, it is a religious matter. It's a uh, point of faith. We believe that uh, rights devolve from a creator, and that, as Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration, that all men, we would say all persons, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Uh, that's something we're all committed to. In the context uh, that we're discussing uh, today, uh, one of them uh, is the uh, workplace context. I've litigated uh, a number of these cases. I haven't sat down to count how many, but it's probably well over a dozen. The one that always uh, always comes to mind uh, as freshest in my mind is actually one I did about five or seven years ago in Denver on behalf of an AT&T employee named Ralph Bonanno. Ralph was uh, working for Verizon uh, and getting along fine. He would express his Christian beliefs about different matters, including sexuality from time to time. Uh, and then when AT&T acquired Verizon as part of its corporate commitment to diversity, it required each employee to sign an affirmation of diversity, a piece of paper that said, I will value all differences between coworkers. And the policy made it clear that one of those differences was a difference of sexuality. Well, Ralph didn't agree with that. Uh, and he objected to it, and he asked for accommodation. The accommodation was denied, and he had to litigate the question. Ultimately, AT&T, to its credit, settled the case and backed down. But that's an example of how these rights come into conflict in dozens of cases uh, in courts across the country. Uh, I represent a uh, uh, librarian in the state of Ohio, one of the uh, Ohio State uh, satellite campuses, uh, who was, whose career was uh, destroyed. Uh, that is not an exaggeration. Who was vilified, ostracized, and his career destroyed merely for recommending as part of the freshman orientation uh, committee that he was on that uh, instead of challenging the conservative students in that part of Ohio uh, to uh, question their deeply held beliefs by having them read what the librarian regarded from his religious point of view as, uh, as liberal books, things like uh, things that Richard Dawkins and Jared Diamond had read were, were other suggestions. He suggested that the freshmen, uh, that the university's orthodoxy be challenged, and he suggested that the, uh, the freshmen read a book called The Marketing of Evil, which talks about, uh, talks about the conflict between religious rights uh, and uh, homosexual rights and different things like that. Well, the, uh, the homosexual members of the faculty took off after him. They savaged his principles. They savaged his ethics. They said they could not send students to him as a research librarian because they couldn't trust him any longer. Uh, and they destroyed his career. He was forced to resign. That's the kind of thing that should not happen. Now, you may argue that within a university, and as a university employee, it was beyond the pale to suggest what 
some people would regard as a bigoted book, uh, but I would argue that, especially in the university context, we have to have respect for uh, views that we disagree with. As we all know, the Supreme Court has said many times that the university is a free marketplace of ideas, but it wasn't, of course, uh, for this librarian. Uh, so those are just a couple of, ex of real-world examples that I have dealt with and am dealing with, uh, and I think that it's too facile to say uh, that we can uh, simply wish away the conflict. The conflict is real. The conflict is uh, presented in dozens of cases across the court that the attorneys of the Alliance Defense Fund and other organizations uh, litigate every day, and uh, we've got to address what that means and what the best legal principles are for uh, negotiating them in a way that preserves the rights of all to the best extent possible. And I have some ideas on that, but I'll yield the floor for now. Okay. Laura, did you want to get something? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that um, toward the end Steve mentioned legal principles because the concern that I have in when you're talking about are these things different for um, between race and gender and sexual orientation is not a question of whether people's there's a whether people's views on these things come from the same place. And uh, most certainly, um, there are different levels of acceptance among different communities. The problem is in crafting law, in crafting a legal principle, do we want to go to a place, you know, courts ultimately have to look at these things, interpret these things, or general counsels have to advise their clients how, how to enforce and implement the law. Do we want a court to make value judgments among the various types of religiously motivated principle I don't believe there should be interracial dating versus I think homosexuality is wrong. I basically don't welcome gay and lesbian people. Do we want a court to pick and choose the religiously held principles, let's say they're sincere, pick and choose among them and decide which ones are accorded protection and required to have accommodation and which ones do not meet a degree of validity? Now in terms of general acceptance, general acceptance of non-discrimination is not really a good principle upon which to base anti-discrimination law. And I would say also, are we going to ask a legislature to craft a line between the kinds of discrimination, the kinds of religious principle, even if you can't agree it's, it's discrimination, the kinds of religious principle that are honored, protected, and enforced, and the kinds that are set aside? Because had that librarian offered a book about the problems with, racism, with race and, and perhaps a difference among the races and a problem with pluralism that, it, that embraces all races and religions, um, I don't believe it would be as sympathetic a case to either juries or funders. So the question is not whether there are differences in the way people feel, but the differences in what a court can do. General acceptance is, is really a backwards way of approaching civil rights law. If racial non-discrimination were generally accepted in 64, arguably we wouldn't have needed civil rights acts. Now in America, non-discrimination for gay and lesbian people hovers around 90% in, in the public consciousness, which is just an order of magnitude greater than the public acceptance of non-discrimination on the basis of race. We do create laws based on a social compact that again, pushes forward acknowledgments of rights and liberties as needed. So, you know, and in terms of the AT&T case, I think settling it was the right thing. The fact that there are companies that in wishing to embody and enforce a principle of non-discrimination do it poorly, and this is an extreme outlying case, and force people to do an affirmation when really all they needed to do to have their corporate culture of inclusion was, you know, have some trainings, reject discriminatory behavior and harassment and not force an affirmation of belief, which is something that I, I think the ACLU would have a problem with as well. Um, that, you know, an outlier in figuring out how to do this right does not in, invalidate the principle of protecting um, these kinds of, of, of policies. Frida, okay. can I ask a follow-up question real quick that I think she can answer quickly that will advance the dialogue? What do you think that would have been the result properly if the librarian had suggested reading Charles Murray, The Bell Curve? Um, you know, that's interesting for, for because some background, there are, it's was, about, yeah, oh yeah. About 10 years ago, oh, I'm sorry, 15 or 20 years ago, a couple of uh, academicians came out with a book called The Bell Curve in which they argued that uh, generally, and I hope I don't uh, misrepresent what they were saying, but generally they were saying that uh, differences in intelligence 
account for differences in success among individuals much more than socioeconomic differences. It was an argument against what he regarded as the class struggle. Uh, and one of the arguments they made that was misinterpreted was that perhaps there might be some genetic link to uh, the degree of success that different races had. Not an, not an idea that I agree with, not an idea I'm sure that most of you or all of you agree with, but they were making the argument. And uh, obviously in some context, it was a First Amendment protected argument. So what do you think the result would have been? Well, I, I would also say that, you know, the First Amendment doesn't necessarily apply to a librarian in promoting um, their, the, their views to students as part of the required cu curriculum. But setting that aside, I very nearly, and see, this is how much we agree, I very nearly put the bell curve forth as my example and didn't because I haven't read it. Uh, but I did know that it had some, <laughs> some racial overtones. Um, I think a, a more um, apt example uh, would be um, an, an affirmatively racist book that actually designates, you know, pluralism and acceptance of racial equality or intermarriage right, or integration can, can um, oh. as uh, that that really was more um, thoroughly, you know, racist. And I know this brings about a, not a legal but an intellectual difference because I understand that it is a, a widely held belief among, you know, various groups that there's nothing discriminatory or negative about gay people per se in books like the ones that you stated. I disagree strongly, but I do come down um, on the side of the university's ability to defend their students from discrimination and from a hostile environment being created by being subjected to, by the way, scientifically and, and factually inaccurate characterizations of GLBT people. That's a discussion people. I think right. we need can, to have, because yeah, we, I don't agree. Well, let, let's, let's try and get back a little bit to, to, to the topic a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and any of, you, I, any of you can answer this, would you make a distinction between a refusal by the state to accommodate uh, religious belief with respect to a general ban, let's say on polygamy, um, versus a, a, a refusal to allow a religious accommodation or religious exception to an anti-discrimination law that protects uh, against uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Are you directing that to me, Peter? And part, well, why don't we start with you? Um, I'm just trying to understand. Um, are, you, and you, are you speaking of a belief about polygamy or a practice of polygamy? A, a practice and an and a inv invocation of the sincerity of a group's religious belief. I think that uh, my, my, my view is that uh, a, a person who is asserting the application of a non-discrimination provision that protects sexual orientation has a passing argument that polygamy is a sexual orientation and that consequently they should be protected. I don't think any gay person or advocate for GLBT equality would. Um, bringing it back about, to legal. About, oh, no, no, that's not true. What about, what about a religious group? That's not true. In, what the, about press, a in the press, groups, can I make this comment? What about a religious group saying that polygamy is, an, is integral to our religious practice? Well, that, that's a, a very well recognized and historic uh, concrete context, of course, of with, course. The, but that's why I want, uh, I want with to the reorganized where, LDS. And right. Let me address that. First of all, let me say that there have been supporters of uh, the uh, uh, gay and lesbian community in California uh, that have said that with the California Supreme Court's ruling, the next step is to, uh, is to uh, protect polygamy. And, Representatives of the ACLU have said the same thing publicly. Well, who said that? <laughs> who said that? <laughs> I haven't heard that. I, uh, yeah, well, if you're interested, it's all documented in our President Alan Sears' book, ACLU versus America. And he quotes from, no, wait a minute. Did, did that come he, out after the California Supreme Court? No, no. It came out about, uh, about four years ago. I'm sorry, I don't have that, but well, well, I have to, let, let, me, let me just I, finish. I, I, the, no, I have to give you answer the question, Jeremy. Finish. You'll get a chance. But what, what I'm going to say is, if you're interested, it's all documented in Alan Sears' book. Uh, and it, has, it is no surprise to anyone that is very familiar with the ACLU that a number of its leaders have, for years, thought that polygamy should be accepted. And at some point down the road, it would be. But I, I guess the question I raised, and I'll let you, Jeremy, I'll, I will let you answer, I promise. Um, <laughs> Okay. The question I raised, Steve, is um, where polygamy is being defended not by the ACLU but by a religious group. 
Is that a legitimate religious accommodation to seek from a generally applicable law? I need some context, though, obviously. Well, obviously, let's say the Latter-day Saints. Or let's, it doesn't even have to be the Latter-day Saints. Let's say an, another religion, you know, a, a religion. Islam. I, I think, Islam. well, no, I think, uh, I think a, a member of the uh, reorganized LDS uh, or somebody of another faith that believes that polygamy uh, is uh, an appropriate religious practice should not suffer discrimination in employment or public accommodations based on that belief. That's the ACLU's position. Good. <laughs> so let's, let's. Uh, okay, go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, with Alan, Alan Sears uh, being the source, I, I, I just received a fundraising letter which I have to show you from Alan Sears, uh, the source on the positions of the ACLU where the headline is ACLU threatening Christians with jail. For 88 years, the American Civil Liberties Union and its allies have fought to silence Christians with coercive court orders and huge financial judgments. Now they are increasingly demanding jail for those who don't comply. Now, this is where we get to the, to the issue of credibility about statements, credibility of authorities, credibility about represent, representing positions of other people. Uh, the ACLU's position on polygamy is that people should not be subjected to, issue, subjected to be firing because of that, uh, and that sh they should not be subject to criminal prosecution. That's a far different position from advocating polygamy, and so we ought to be perfectly clear on that. But let's get back to, to part of the underlying question that we have and, and take the particular case from Texas that we've just seen during the last couple of months, the fundamental, fundamentalist LDS case. This is where we have the difficulty between uh, smears that are being made in public and what the actual issues are that, are that are present in the case. First, we can say that I don't know of anybody, whether it's the, AC, the lawless ACLU or any other organization, that would be saying that it is permissible to abuse children, whether it is sexually or forced marriages or whatever. The child abuse is reprehensible and it should be condemned. And for the state of Texas to take action to deal with what, is, what may in fact be legitimate evidence of child abuse would be entirely appropriate. But that's a whole different thing from saying there are vague rumors about child abuse and marching in and taking away all children and separating them from all of their parents, partly on the basis that there are these allegations about abuse and partly dislike of the practice of polygamy. We need to keep our facts straight and we need to be focusing on the specific issue. For actual evidence of child abuse, the state is, is irresponsible if it doesn't take steps to deal with that. And in the FLDS case, there may in fact be cases of that and the state should prosecute them. But the state should not be making general statements about the religion and either arresting people or separating uh, parents from their children without individualized hearings to determine the facts in the specific cases. Okay, I'm just going to let Laura respond and Jean, I think you wanted to say something and then we'll open it up. Yeah, the um, heart of, of the polygamy and sexual orientation question is something that we often term the status conduct um, distinction. Uh, there are those who argue uh, that homosexuality is fine, but the conduct of marrying, having sex, actually living your sexuality is what's at issue. It's proper and okay to discriminate against that, and that's what makes it like polygamy. In the alternative, polygamy could be if you want to own that sexual orientation is an orientation, and this is not a public debate. The American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the social workers are not wrong about the source of sexual orientation. It shouldn't matter, actually. But this is not a source of debate except among people who want to gin this up as a debate. But the argument goes, okay, you're going to recognize so-called sexual orientation, we'll call polygamy an, uh, an orientation. Now, this has no basis in science or fact either, but it's, it's a fun argument, it's a compelling argument, it's one that people who don't think about this real often like and relate to. But so then the second question has to go to third-party harm. Now, there are third-party harms of polygamy. There's 
the, the possibility of raising people into an extremely oppressive society, kicking their young boys out so there are enough women for the few men who get to stay, all of the evils um, that my colleague here addressed. And there are the questions of, do we allocate our resources as a society to say, given social security to, to you know three different surviving lives as opposed to one? These are questions of third party harm. Now, proponents of the idea that sexual orientation is a conduct and that either marriage is a problem or non-discrimination is a problem have asserted that there are third party harms to letting gay people have their relationships and in particular have children, and they're all wildly offensive. Um, and they've also even indicated kind of a protectionism of the gay person. You know, you're exposing yourself to disease. You know, you're exposing yourself to the psychological harm of living this horrible, terrible way of living. Um, but ultimately, setting aside those arguments that, I, again, are just not supported by the actual expert and factual senses of, of who we are as human beings, um, there, there really is, for, for people who are looking at this as a, as a, as a status conduct, uh, distinction, a distinction between being born gay and living your sexuality and engaging in a practice that is a very culturally created practice that is still quite prevalent in much of the world and that our society, uh, on which I don't have a judgment for those societies, and uh, which our society, for I think very good reasons, has rejected. Gee. Um, <laughs> that's all. struggled with these issues for some time, actually having uh, uh, even had some rather public uh, uh, struggles with some of these issues. I, I think we shouldn't overlook the fact that this can involve for serious constitutions, for people powerfully committed to equality and people powerfully uh, committed to uh, religious freedom. This can involve difficult questions, difficult, challenging questions. Um, if we look at it all as uh, looking at the case out of uh, Texas or, or concerning uh, <coughs> multiple marriage partners and the like, it can seem like there are easier or more straightforward answers. But if, if you focus, for example, on the, the university student group issue, uh, I think whether you look at this, as I, as I know the ACLU would, at least initially, I would, uh, as a question of expressive association, the, the right, the ability to decide who your group is going to be, who, who's going to be in the group, and what you're going to stand for. Um, a right of importance to all Americans. Um, a right which can be implicated by some of these uh, choices. Or if you look at it as a right of religious exercise, which is more complicated legally probably, given uh, Smith's debilitation. Um, uh, but we have, uh, in many states, uh, small ripros, uh, I guess. Uh, and I think most of us, most uh, strong constitutionalists, believe in a, a potent notion of religious uh, exercise, too. If you have those uh, conflicting matters, then ultimately this is going to turn, despite all of these various um, examples, it's going to turn on, on the, the nature of the burden to the religious belief or the freedom of expression, and the justification for it. Um, both of those are going to be powerful and important. If, if, you, if you take these non-discrimination uh, provisions as applied to race, for example, I assume that, uh, that, that, that virtually all agree that uh, a race discrimination uh, and anti-race discrimination principle would trump the the claims of uh, religious exercise, at least in the university context. Then we get further arguments about, well, was that the same when it comes to sexual uh, orientation and the like? There's no doubt that universities are asserting important interests uh, in, uh, in trying to support and sustain their non-discrimination policies. I, uh, I uh, sort of grew up at the University of North Carolina, long, uh, heartbreaking discussions with People like Chief Justice Henry Fry and Julius Chambers, our first among our first black uh, graduates, talking about their experiences at the university when the doors were open, perhaps forcibly, but they were barred from all student organizations uh, 
on claims of association, uh, uh, claims of the right to choose your membership, and the hugely diminished experience. Uh, the notion of a diverse student body, which is from the Michigan case and, and more broadly, uh, is understood as one of the cornerstones of uh, uh, university life. It's not very far from that to have outstanding uh, rules which say our groups have to be open to everyone. Uh, there are strong justifications for such determinations. Now, if you have that conflict and you're going to have to have exceptions or you're going to consider exceptions, then as my colleague from the ACLU would say, there, we need to know there are difficulties and challenges and uh, there's oddness about granting exemptions uh, because you are in fact saying as a religious group, I don't want the rules to apply to me. I want some sort of uh, special claim. If you do that in the university context to non-discrimination groups, for example, that, that wouldn't be the end of it. Uh, universities frequently say to student fee-based decisions, well, student groups have to be open, uh, uh, comprised only of students, or student fee dollars cannot be used for electioneering or for uh, political engagement. I can imagine those restrictions being challenged under free exercise or expressive kind of claims. I don't know why they would fare any worse uh, than a non-discrimination policy. And if you start granting exceptions, uh, then it won't just be the Christian Legal Society that will ask for them. Uh, it will be other religious groups. But beyond that, because the stronger claim, it seems to me, is based on expressive association, you're going to have, I mean, it's perfectly fine, it would be perfectly fine then for Lambda to say that we won't allow uh, heterosexual uh, members. You change from a regime that everyone can apply to a very different one, which I think, if that's the way we go, will eventually mean that universities ditch, uh, uh, certainly public universities ditch uh, fee-based uh, determinations and the like. The last thing I would say is, that unlike anybody else, or unlike most here, I've spent the last three years or so with undergraduates very uh, direct and sort of hands-on notions. Uh, and in looking at this, I, I read a statement that the Vice President for Student Affairs had made at Ohio State when they, under threat of litigation, had changed and allowed an exemption from their anti-discrimination policies. Uh, he said, almost every one of our hundreds of student organizations, religious and otherwise, have no qualms about opening their membership to all. But for those few who truly and sincerely believe that open membership would violate their religious beliefs, we need to allow them the option of following their faith. I will say this, uh, largely speaking, when you talk to students, talk to undergraduates, about this notion of discriminating against lesbians uh, and gay men, not allowing them uh, into their organizations, very potently and powerfully, uh, they say, God, what, this is the argument of my parents and my grandparents. It has nothing to do with me. We, we wouldn't consider uh, a, a determination like that. It's, I think as the years go ahead, at least on this front, there will be fewer and fewer, it's going to be harder to find plaintiffs. Uh, your, your work will be cut out for you. Um, <laughs> and more and more, even more than it is now, the litigation will come from outside groups and less uh, be brought and driven by those internal to the campus. And I think that has to do with differences in the way this generation looks at the world as opposed to the way my own did. Okay, let's let's open it up. There's obviously a, okay, the gentleman right in the middle. I think there's a microphone that'll be coming around. If we could just keep these uh, I questions wanna, rather than statements. I want to take Laura on on the Boy Scouts case, but a quick anecdote that Keen made me remember. I served on the executive committee of the National American Civil Liberties Union when uh, the Rosenberger versus the University of Virginia case uh, was granted cert. And this falls under, you gotta love the ACLU. Um, <laughs> there was an emergency meeting of the executive committee to determine number one, since cert was granted, whether or not we should do an amicus brief. And number two, on which side? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love the ACLU. Um, Laura, the um, Boy Scouts' rights of association are certainly something that I would respect if indeed it were an independent, not government-supported organization. 
but from the mundane um, of the President of the United States as titular head of the Boy Scouts, to the money for the jamboree, to the stocking of trout ponds with federal money, to the new, re last week passed, or week before last passed um, legislation in the House with only 17 people objecting, saying that uh, the, um, there was going to be a coin issued by the Treasury um, to pr help fund the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts, I might add, unlike the Girl Scouts, don't allow gay people in and don't allow atheists in. I am representing the Secular Coalition for America, an organization which represents the rights of atheists, humanists, and free thinkers. And we think that the federal government's money, your tax dollars, shouldn't go to the Boy Scouts and that the Boy Scouts case was wrongly decided. Um, well, I, I appreciate uh, that perspective. Um, by way of, of, of personal disclosure, I, I don't think we're far apart. Uh, by way of personal disclosure, when I was a summer associate, um, my firm uh, was representing the Boy Scouts in Dale, one of several council that Boy Scouts had been such a long-standing client. I think their client number was like four, and the firm was 100 years old. Um, and I declined t after reading a bunch of the materials <laughs> half-heartedly and a very compelling uh, opinion by DC's Corporation Council that, that the Boy Scouts was, in fact, uh, public and, and not a, a private association that, that I did find compelling. I went to the partners and declined to work on the case and then declined my offer there on the basis of my feelings about the case. Um, again, I think, not that I'm so virtuous, that in a large sense we, we bind ourselves to our principles, even if they have costs, um, that's separate from the, I think, very abstruse question and, and very fact-based question of the Boy Scouts' actual status. We agree that government subsidy of this, of, of the organization, can be repugnant due to the fact of their policies regarding non believers or believers in a, a non-religiously based belief system is ac more accurate and I apologize um, and, and, and GLBT people. Um, I've often annoyed my orthodox parents by referring to myself as a person of reason. If you can be a person of faith, I can be. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I think we agree that there is a line, and I, I think that the question of whether the Boy Scouts in particular is a public uh, association is, is a very, and that's maybe why the ACLU came down where they did, is, is not one of those principles on which uh, you know, people take or don't take their jobs so much, although it's interesting. And the question of whether we're bound as a society to uh, subsidize that is a different one. Um, so I, I, I think that's what makes this so difficult. In terms of, you know, only 17 people voting against it, you know, this is why the Boy Scout stuff is, is great fodder. Because you don't vote against the Boy Scouts. It's like, and, and I hate puppies. <laughs> uh, but I do, think, I, I do think we share the same concerns about this. And it's, it, it's one of those tough questions. Steve, if the Boy Scouts are free to uh, define their association as they wish, is it, is it legitimate for Congress or the public to deny funding to them, public funding? If the, if any government action is taken against a, an expressive association, and the proper rubric is not whether it's a private association or a public association, the proper rubric according to the Supreme Court in Dale is, as well as uh, Duarte and Roberts, is whether it's an expressive association. Boy Scouts, the Supreme Court said, was an expressive association. Uh, if the action is taken by the government uh, in whatever form, uh, by the executive, by the legislature, uh, based on its viewpoints, then uh, I think it violates the First Amendment. Thank you. With regard to uh, the question of uh, RIFRA granting exceptions to religious organizations from laws of general applicability, I'm wondering if any one of you can comment on the Justice Department's <coughs> analysis of RIFRA that was recently articulated in a memoir, I believe it's on its website, that uh, 
there can be no compelling interest on the part of Congress in enacting laws that bar discrimination on the basis of religion by religious organization. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of a law that I help administer, which is the Workforce Investment Act, which applies to the nation's job training system, and also with regard to other, other laws that are of general applicability in programs that are administered by DOJ particularly. Can anybody comment on that specific analysis by DOJ? I, I can, unless you want to, Jeremy. Um, that is an argument we make on a regular basis, that the government has no interest, uh, let alone a compelling one, in uh, determining what the membership or leadership criteria of an expressive association should be. Uh, and the Supreme Court has said as much in Roberts and in Dale. Roberts, of course, uh, turned on whether the exclusion of women was uh, necessary for the expression of the group, and it wasn't. Uh, Boy Scouts came out the other way because the exclusion of those who don't agree with the Boy Scouts' value judgment was the essence of who the Boy Scouts are uh, as they express their mission to the world uh, and as they craft their membership and leadership positions accordingly. In the university context, we feel that a university, uh, which is administering an open marketplace of ideas and trying to teach young people the value of civic engagement and the First Amendment should not be telling uh, the student organizations on campus what their membership and leadership policies should be vis-a-vis -vis religion and religious beliefs about sexual identity. Would you consider that also to be the case in instances in which uh, an organization is receiving federal financial assistance purportedly to carry out quasi-governmental activities such as providing employment-related support? Well, Cornelius would say that if either the federal government or a state government excluded an organization from a combined charity, uh, that's where they pass the hat around a public workplace uh, and public employees contribute to it. Uh, Cornelius versus uh, NAACP is a seminal case. Uh, and Wyman out of the Second Circuit is the principal case uh, on the state level. Uh, if the federal government or the state government is excluding a voluntary association, expressive association, from being able to secure contributions on a voluntary basis from employees because it doesn't agree with their viewpoints or because it doesn't agree with its membership criteria, that's a violation of both the right of free expression and the right of association. Wyman was incorrectly decided because Wyman missed the point. The court in Wyman said that it was a subsidy. It is not a subsidy. It's a forum. You don't subsidize private speakers by giving them access to a government platform, and you don't subsidize the Boy Scouts or the Christian Legal Society or the American Civil Liberties Union when you offer to let them pass the hat around uh, a, public, uh, a public workplace. Uh, as long as it's not disruptive, the court said in Cornelius, uh, and as long as it's uh, not going to interfere with the reasons for the campaign, uh, then it's constitutionally inappropriate to exclude one because of viewpoint discrimination. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were know talking about people em, employed by, you know, who are actually performing the quasi-governmental function for the public as a service. Is I that the question? Let me try again. So, yeah. uh, all right. Okay. Okay. Generally, okay. 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 Forty-five seconds, Steve. <laughs> Let me make sure I understand question. You're saying, should there be a uh, subsidy for an organization that discriminates on the base, uh, in, in employment? I'm right? saying that there is a you generally know applicable law, otherwise okay. applicable to all other organizations that says you cannot discriminate on various bases, including religion. Uh -huh. Religious organizations are seeking exceptions to that otherwise generally applicable law, which was enacted
you know what? We I think I have a lot of vision. other questions. I'm going to let you pick this up afterwards. Yeah, okay. you're talking let's, about let's, world vision, and I think that the Justice Department got it right in the world vision case because all they said was uh, that RIFRA. All right. Go ahead. Go, RIFRA applies sorry. because it's a okay. government enactment. Okay, right here. Uh, just a, <clears throat> a couple of comments. Uh, like Gene Nickel, I'm a product of the University of North Carolina. Actually, he's not a product. He was a he was employed there and did a wonderful job as the dean of the law school. A couple of thoughts about this business with the universities, public universities. First of all, um, when I was a student at UNC and we had student fee-based organizations, uh, I was a member of, of a number of student organizations, one of which was a religious organization. The university in those days would never have thought to give us money, and we would never have thought to take it because the entanglement of the, between the government and religion over money, no matter how trivial and no matter what level, is an inherently complicated and, and, and issue that's fraught with these very conflicts. Uh, but I come at this, these issues from an interesting standpoint. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the ACLU. I have a son who is a minister. He, he's, he is a minister in Massachusetts where gay marriage is legal. He, he had, and, and without go, going into the details, here's my question. On the gay marriage issue, it seems to me one of the big problems we have is that we have again entangled government in, in what is essentially, for lots of people, a religious practice. For half the people in the country, it isn't. It's simply a contractual matter entered into in, under a civil authority. Should we require all people to treat marriage first as a matter of civil contract and then go to whatever religious authority they profess to believe in or if they wish to get it sanctified or approved or blessed or whatever term you want to use? Would that, is, the, is that a possible solution uh, to try to prevent some of these conflicts from coming into being in the first place? I, I think it's a solution in search of a problem. Um, <laughs> we already give people a choice of how they will sol solemnize and, and, and make official their marriage. Their clergy members are authorized by the, you know, power vested in me by the Commonwealth of whatever, uh, to, to be the person who is the liaison between the couple and the state. And, and maybe that is a problem, but, from a sort of a libertarian or non-entanglement perspective, but it is, you know, our tradition, and and, uh, and and as marriage has become available, those denominations that embrace marriage for same-sex couples are taking advantage of that. Reform Judaism would be an example. Unitarian Universalists would be an example. So uh, I, the dichotomy between belief in, in marriage equality and religion, I think, is, is a somewhat false and muddled one. But people also have the option to go to their county clerk or similar, depending on the state, and, and get their marriage license and, and a ceremony and have a justice of the peace or ship captain or judge, whoever it is, and, uh, and get it solemnized there. The ability of a same-sex couple to pursue either course doesn't fundamentally alter the ability of a religious person. Now, I think what you're saying is like, maybe we should get rid of it because this entanglement is troubling. But this entanglement, in, in, and, I, and I am a, a separationist uh, by, by principle and not, not by profession. Um, but, but, the, but the entanglement, if you will, has, has been a part of our pluralistic approach to how to do this. And people have had the liberty of conscience to pursue it as they will. So I actually think it is a solution in search of a problem, although the problem as you're, as you're framing it is one that is instructive for the way that we place religion and government side by side or sometimes overlapping in a variety of contexts. But I don't think the marriage context is unique by any stretch. Isn't it funny he's to my left? <laughs> and I'm to his right? It never happens. <laughs> Uh, Hugh, I'd say I, I don't see this as that same sort of conflict. That is the same-sex marriage uh, question. It, it is a uh, not, I wouldn't say it's a straightforward question, but it is an exploration of how powerful the American demand for equality uh, is. Uh, and if uh, a state uh, uh, or a court system uh, chooses to say, as, as I would uh, applaud, uh, that the same rights ought to be available to same-sex couples as to heterosexual couples, uh, then it seems to me that's not presenting a, a problem of uh, 
the free exercise of religion or of establishment issues. Uh, it's a question of how broadly we will interpret um, uh, our, our command of equality. Now, I understand you can have a potential question of uh, uh, th should there have to be an exemption in a court clerk or something who doesn't want to uh, entertain uh, same-sex marriages. And uh, so then you could have such an issue arise, though uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a, p a powerful argument that undertaking a government responsibility, you are there to carry out public obligations and to do them uh, equally to all members of the Commonwealth. So I don't think it's much of one. But typically, the question of uh, should there be same-sex marriage doesn't present this conflict, which uh, I think is so wrenching in some other context. All right, we have five minutes. So let's take two questions, and then we can let folks answer them as they choose. Those two right there. Stuart McTell, Columbia Law School. Um, I want to actually talk a bit about, get your sense on, where is expressed association right now in the doctrine? Um, you mentioned Dale, but also Rumsfeld v. Uh, Fair impacted that doctrine um, and appeared to pull back some of the protections Dale provided. Uh, thinking, for example, that the court itself decided when there was interference with the expressed association and what kind of association would interfere with the group's message. Whereas Dale, the court seems like a very strong uh, statement that the group decided and the courts would not second guess. Um, given that there seems to be now court interference deciding what can go the government do that would interfere with the group's message, and <coughs> to create room for a statement of the court in actually JCs, where the court said that it wouldn't rely, wouldn't allow groups to rely on stereotypes of groups. They said, JCs couldn't rely that women on a stereotype that women would have certain viewpoints and that women would interfere with their message, uh, and they couldn't use that. Given those sort of statements, where is the doctrine now, and how could that play into a religious group deciding they want to exclude certain groups because of stereotypes they have about what that group is and stands for? Okay, let, let's take the other question at the same time, and then we'll. Uh, I just had a question. Gene mentioned earlier uh, the difference in the generational attitude towards uh, GLBT rights, or I'm sorry, non-polygamous GLBT rights. But um, <laughs> the, I wonder, you know, that the, a large subset. does it have, you know, I don't, I'm a law student, I haven't, haven't had much interaction with lawmakers or judges. Um, hopefully maybe more of you have and you can shed some light on this, but is it, you know, for our Supreme Court justices and most of our lawmakers and our judges, they were, you know, grew up and went to law school in a time where homosexuality was, you know, in the DSM as a mental illness. Um, is it truly just kind of an ick factor when it comes to that, that this older generation is, or is it that they've perhaps seen more than our younger generation? I mean, I live with uh, three guys who were in the army, they're self-proclaimed rednecks, uh, they're avid devourers of Fox News, but they have extremely progressive and positive attitudes towards, you know, GLBT people. Um, I think it truly is a generational thing, but I'm so confused as to why our lawmakers and our judges have such a hard time recognizing the changing attitude towards us. And I was wondering if any of you can shed a light on what, what do you think causes it? Well, I guess that, that pr part of that is the sincerity of one's religious belief that is, that does not recognize, uh, you know, same-sex marriage or, you know, rights based on sexual orientation, is that going to change over time, uh, over the generation? Uh, you know, I, we are not uh, anymore becoming a less religious society generationally. But across the board, generation to generation, there is greater acceptance, and that includes among evangelical people age 18 to 29. Um, I'm not totally comfortable with ascribing to the court's generational senses of what it means to be GLBT, although that often informs their decisions, because I think in a sense we don't necessarily want the courts to just be putting a stamp on where we are culturally. Um, that would have stopped Brown v. Board and Loving from happening. I, you know, I think it's hugely familiarity. I mean, uh, th this generation uh, 
grows up uh, knowing all kinds of uh, uh, colleagues that they have great affection for who were uh, lesbians or gay men or transgendered. Uh, they think it normal and regular and routine. Uh, it, it more is pressed the other way. I think if you talk it through with them. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this is every student because you, you will find those who will want to press these claims, and that will be true in five years and ten years. But the reason I bring it up is if, if you talk about this with most students, it's not just that they are uh, of the view that there should be no discrimination against gays and lesbians. They find it astonishing anyone would consider the opposite. Uh, it seems so uh, clearly uh, the, the way that they have uh, lived. Uh, so I think that this one dispute is going to wear itself out uh, eventually, and I'm, I'm heartened by that. I, I, I'm, I'm going to let Steve have the last word. Well, maybe not the last word, but have a word on this. <laughs> I, I will do that by telling you the story across the street at Georgetown Law Center. I was in uh, law school 20 years ago. And in 1987, I'm dating myself, uh, but I'm finding as I get older that's more and more okay, I started the Georgetown chapter of the Christian Legal Society. I had no opposition in doing so. In fact, I had some support from uh, friendly members of the administration. Uh, it was, after all, uh, and still is a Jesuit school. As most of you know, at the same time, there was a conflict brewing with the a uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender group at Georgetown that wanted recognition and sought it under the D.C. Human Rights Act. Well, of course, the D.C. court ruled in 1987 that it was entitled to that recognition. At that time, was the gay and lesbian group, group's opposition coming from the folks in my group, the Christians? No, it was not. We were not rallying to oppose their recognition. We were not uh, speaking out against them, we were not trying to make life difficult for them. Twenty years ago, it's completely different. Most of the cases I'm involved in got started because either an outlaw group or somebody associated with the gay and lesbian community at the law school or the, gra or the undergraduate school was up in arms because there was a recognized group on campus that was teaching either that marriage should be between a man and a woman or that uh, the proper view of human sexuality is that heterosexuality is the norm. Uh, and over and over again, I've seen this. I am more concerned today about the rights of Christian groups, and especially evangelical Christian groups and other religious groups that hold to old orthodox norms, than I am about the rights of, uh, of homosexual groups for that reason. And I would encourage you all to think about that. And when you have an opportunity, uh, speak out in favor of the First Amendment and in favor of airing all views on a subject because that's what I think we all owe one another. Thank are you, you. Are you seeing a generational shift in terms of uh, the opposition? I, I'm seeing different shifts. I mean, it's, it, it's always risky to be categorical. And what I'm seeing is that evangelical young people who are engaged in this issue are more passionate than they were 20 or 30 years ago about, uh, about uh, traditional marriage, more passionate about trying to articulate uh, the, uh, the Christian message about, uh, about marriage and about sexuality. And yes, there are some that are, uh, are, are less concerned about the issue, but uh, I don't think that broadly across the demographic you can make any uh, single conclusion like that. I think the, 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 the yeah, that's all I'd say about it. Thank you. I'm sorry I wouldn't pick up your doctrine question. I'll let them do that afterwards. But thank you for a provocative panel. Thank you. Thank you.